I begin by acknowledging that I am a visitor in this sacred territory. And I come with humility and with thanksgiving that we can gather with purpose. Earlier as we were gathering, I heard an infant in the room and I knew I was in the right place. <laughs> the rest of you came, that's fine, but the fact that, <laughs> that a child came is significant. Within our cultural understanding, there really isn't a reason to gather unless the little ones are there. So their purpose and the work that Cindy does that amazes us and can transform how we see the world through the eyes of children. So I've come today to say that much of what you've heard is only partly true about me, about me, because you see, from the beginning of my life, I have been in the midst of wisdom and grace and love, and that has allowed me to wonder about life. And in the first grade, my teacher in the classroom had us in rows, and I wasn't very attentive. I was looking out the window for, through most of the first year, trying to adjust to this classroom setting. I didn't do very well. And so I think one of the things I bring to this conversation tonight is that reconciliation for us on Turtle Island is more than in Inuak, Anishinaabe, Anodashone, or other First Peoples coming together, or all of us being together. It is in fact really about how we are on the earth together, how we share life on the earth. I was very fortunate, I think about 30 years ago, to read the words of Lila Watson, Aborigine woman from Australia. Most of you probably have seen the words or heard the words. If you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. If you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Lila Watson's insight as a woman into the need for some equity and some place of relationship is significant. It continues to be a challenge, a real challenge for our society to understand that we are all related. So when we go to the lodge to pray, we say, all my relations. I think there's something about that in the gospel. It echoes in the life of the church if we could only remember that we are in fact children of Kisei Manitou. We are children of the Creator. And so the complications we have in this life, the complications of how to be just and loving with all of our children in the land, the complications of how to share the wealth and resources among the peoples, the complications of confusing individual rights with community rights and never finding a balance is a strange situation in a society so blessed with educational opportunities. So as an indigenous person, I've had blessings. Two days ago, as we were coming to Toronto, Dot and I, my partner, we stopped in Curve Lake because our good friend, Elder Murray Wheatung, 97, lives in his own home there in that community. And Murray has been a blessing to the whole church. Murray's the last surviving elder who sat in the teepee in Sudbury to receive the apology almost 31 years ago. 
And we walked into his house, and Murray started telling stories. He filled my soul. I hadn't seen him for a number of years, but we sat together, and he spoke to us. And people like Murray have been a part of my life. So whatever vision or thought I may have that is of any value at all is because I've known Murray Wheatung. I've also known, Murray Wheatung is Anishinaabe, and I've known a Lakota woman in Manitoba, bless her spirit in the spirit world, Gladys Cook, involved in much of her life in the Anglican community, but she was a woman of wisdom and, and love. Gladys in residential school was abused. Her grandparents were driven from the US by the Kishimoka Manak, the Long Knives, and Gladys came to Canada as a refugee. And throughout her life, Gladys demonstrated that reconciliation can be real. Not a dream, not a figment, not an impossibility. But through her life, her way, her telling of stories, her presence in the wider community, she visited the youth in the lockup as where juveniles are kept. She spent time in the women's jail caring for the women. As a volunteer, she was in many places bringing love and hope despite her experience. She was able to transform lives of others by her love. When Dot and I moved to Norway House in 1971, we met Florence, Florence Muskego, an elder of the church. And it's uncommon in, in the North where the Methodist Church was active in mission to find women who were elders in the church. It becomes a, a guy thing, right? So Florence and a couple of other women in Norway House had broken the barrier, the, the glass ceiling, or what is it called? They they'd made it into the leadership of the community. And Florence had decided that her ministry was this. She would be a midwife to the dying. Before there was any conversation in medical circles about palliative care, Florence Muskega was walking miles in the winter in Norway House to go and sit with people in their homes as they spent their last days with their family. She cared for families and for those who were going to the spirit world. So do I understand anything about life? Do I know anything about the wisdom that is possible for humans on the earth? Not really. But I am amazed by the consistency of loving action and reconciliation among the elders with whom I've had privilege to sit. So thanks be to the Creator that we are still living in the midst of possibility I therefore encourage you not only to be troublemakers, that's for sure, that's for sure, be troublemakers, but also sit with the young ones, sit with the little ones, tell stories that they don't even want to listen to. <laughs> Keep on talking even when they're texting. I think we have a great challenge in this day to maintain some element of the oral tradition, some element of human spirit touching human spirit, where the drum is alive and is the heartbeat of the people, where our traditions of learning on the land are not forgotten. So in a couple of days, we'll be back home, and we'll be putting in a garden and I have a neighbor just down the road from where we live, and he's a traditional agriculturalist, right? He plants grain. And what he does is he goes out after two warm sunny days, and he takes his boot and he sweeps aside the, the straw, the stubble, moves the earth aside a bit, pulls down his pants and sits on the ground. 
because he wants to know if he can sit there for two minutes, then the ground is ready for the crop. Right? <laughs> so I wanted to tell you tonight that because the TRC has come forward, because we have the Declaration of the United Nations on the rights of Indigenous peoples, because you recognize that our future must be cared for and must be given some breath and life, we have a window of opportunity. So I'm not inviting you to go down onto Young Street and pull down your pants. <laughs> but that might not be a bad idea. <laughs> because you see, one of the things we lack in the United Church of Canada, in my experience, is the deep humility that allows us to start over. The deep humility that allows us to be fully human. Someone reminded me tonight that I've said at other gatherings, we are humans being. We're not objects. We're transformable, redeemable creatures who are seeking to find our place on the earth. Kakinao and wako maganak, all my relations. Thank you.